Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly podcast for all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Hello. And Robert. Hello. And tonight's episode is going to be all about collaborators, choosing them, working with them, and, um, you know. Killing them? All... Oh, wait, no, sorry. No, not killing them. Oh, not it's in general. entirely different show. Yeah, that would be a different show. That would be maybe part two of the collaborator <laughs> show. So, um, Robert, I believe you proposed this topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Stephen, you proposed the topic. I don't know. I got an email at an ungodly hour this morning, and uh, or a text, and woke me up. That was what's up? I'm yeah. already up. I've been up for like an hour and a half. Oh, well, good for you. I don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I get to sleep till 8.30 in the mornings on my Sundays. Yes, I don't understand that concept, but okay. <laughs> Just All right. You speak of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, anyway, back to collaborations. Yep. What were you thinking, Stephen? Well, you know, a lot of research is a collaborative process, right? I mean, there's there was an interesting paper that came out in Science a couple of years ago that said that group publications had a higher impact uh on and science, more citations, uh, follow up, etc., than did sole author papers. And as a teams person, which is I, I study teams work, I think it's pretty important to think about that collaboration idea. Uh, better ideas, more creative ideas, etc. Um, so, so this was, I guess, an area that I think is really quite critical in what we end up doing. And I've been a person who's been working with a lot of different people in my career. I like working on three, four, five uh, author papers, which in my side of the world, that's more. You do four or five authors, that's actually a pretty long paper. I know that you move to the physics world, you know, you have, what, 7,000 people on the most recent CERN paper, so... There was, like, there was a paper like that, yeah, yeah, yeah it happens. So that, that's not quite the same idea, but um, I don't consider that to be collaboration per se. That's a large organization at 7,000 people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I guess what, what I think about is what is the purpose of what you're trying to do? You know, that's the question I'm always asking myself. What am I trying to accomplish in any given research study? And, you know, I've been doing this now. I've been a faculty member for 11 years and, and you know, PhD student for five years before that. So that's a long time working on this stuff. And I know what my strengths are and my weaknesses are. And so I'm always looking for ways to complement myself, you know, that you can find a way to fit somebody who can do something better than what I can. You know, it's, that may not be the same thing. I may be, you know, the, the lead writer or theoretician on something. I may be the best methodologist on something. I may be the best study design on a different one. But I want somebody who can compliment me and, and I think oftentimes push me because I like to learn. I'm one of those guys who, you know, if I'm sitting down with somebody, I want to figure out, well, what did they do? How did they do that right? How did it get better for them? I want to know what their process is. So for me, a lot of that is looking for people who I can benefit from. Now, not in a sort of, a, you know, steal from them kind of a way or just, you know, leech off of them, but really of a, you know, what can they, how can I, they bring something to me and then I can again compliment them back so we can get something more successful. Um, at this point in my career, you know, theoretically I should be working more with PhD students. PhD students should be my perhaps primary area of, of collaboration, but we're in a, in a, department where we just don't have many PhD students in general, but particularly PhD students in what I do. Uh, it's actually one of the big issues that we're running into is that we just don't, we have now two or three team scholars and nobody, no doctoral students want to do teamwork research. So it's kind of awkward for us. Uh, so a lot of my collaboration is external. So it's, you know, this goes back to an earlier conversation we had, you know, a couple weeks ago talking about, you know, what do you get out of conferences? And for me, a lot of that is, you know, getting to meet some people and saying, you know, what are you working on? What's interesting? And, you know, finding a way to match them with me in some sort of way. Uh, some of these things, you know, are three or four year gestation. I've got a person that I'm working on. Uh, we're going to collect data in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I think we started talking maybe five years ago. And it really took that long to find a project that really worked for the two of us. But it was a person you could talk to. It was fun. It was interesting. And eventually we found that, that common space. Um, so that's my big thing, is always looking for somebody who, who compliments me in some sort of way. And I'm, I'm very open to just having a conversation. Uh, the other piece, too, is I do enough research that, you know, if I don't enjoy working with somebody, they're off my list. You know, I don't have right. to do this with this another person. So for me, it's another big piece is I want to enjoy the process. If I don't enjoy it, it's, it's, I mean, I don't care if you're the smartest person on the face of the earth. I, I can work with somebody else. Sure, sure. Yeah, when... when um 
when you mentioned this as a potential topic, I was trying to think about, you know, how do I go about choosing collaborators? And a lot of times it, I don't, I would say that I don't actually necessarily choose them. They kind of just happen. And, and like, I don't, I haven't really gone out seeking collaborators. It's in the past, it's just sort of been an organic growth of uh, conversations out of conversations that I've had, you know, uh, one collaborator I could think of contacted me via email to talk to me about, um, results that I got from a paper that I had written uh, a, a month or two prior to when he emailed me, and as we started chatting, it you know came clear that he and I are working on similar problems, and he he sort of bounced an idea off of me, and this idea grew into a paper, you know, eventually. Uh, but it wasn't sort of a planned collaboration; it was more of a chatting kind of thing. And uh, more recent collaboration that I have, uh, same way, I actually contacted this individual and um, asked her about her experimental setup in, in her laboratory. She had referenced a particular instrument that she had been using, and I was basically wanted to say, "Hey, what did you think of that? How did, well did it work with, for you?" So on and so forth. Conversations, you know, grew, and one thing led to another, and now we're sharing data and you know, talk, passing things back and forth to each other. Um, so again, not an intentional. I want to ad- uh, collaborate with this person for the following reasons. It's been more of an organic process for me. Um, and I think it's the vast majority of my collaborations have been like that. And actually, the times where I have sought somebody out specifically, I think it's not been as successful hmm. as when I've had these things just sort of come together, gestate over time, kind of an idea. Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, interesting experience. Well, I, I mean. mean with your students, Chris, how do you pick them? Oh, now my students, I, I, okay, so when I was talking about collaborators, I was talking about, you know, with other PhDs, right? right? Yeah. And so now with my students, it's a bit different. So we don't have PhD students where I am. So I have to rely solely on undergraduates. And I've spent actually most of my career researching solely with undergraduates as students. And uh, generally what I'm looking for there is historically a student who's – not just good in class, but also reliable and works hard. So they may not necessarily be the best student in the class, but they put the effort in so that I know that if I come to them with a task, I know that they will work on it and and likely, of course, do well, succeed. And then from there, you know, that's sort of how I've chosen my students. This year, I've done something different. I actually, for my research group, had students apply. And I wanted to give that a shot and see. They basically just sent me an email and said, I'm interested in working with you. Um, I asked them to basically tell me why are you interested in working with me and what skills do you have? And I told them, I said, you know what? You might think that all I care about is what computer languages you know. But the truth of the matter is, if you're good at plumbing, I want to know that. Okay. All right. If you have carpentry skills, I'd like to know. Any weird skill or what you perceive to be is a weird skill in an academic setting, let me know because you never know what I might think be useful. You need to put an addition on your house? Um. Uh, well, no, but uh, this experiment that I have running with um, in combustion, uh, I need to have a good chimney for my um, combustor. And so, yeah, and usually we build those out of um, from whatever materials we have at hand. And so if they have good woodworking skills, they probably have not necessarily the chimneys we made out of wood, but they have the ability to build something with their hands. Right. So traditionally, like when Stephen and I work with like a PhD student, we're thinking of them as an apprentice, get them some mm-hmm. skills, get them a job. For you, it's mainly to get them into grad school, right? Uh, not necessarily, because I don't expect that my research students end up going to graduate school. Uh, I, I just want someone who's interested in having research experience. And okay. most of them, yeah, and most of them don't go into, they do, the ones that do go into graduate school, um, don't go to graduate school for my field of nonlinear dynamics. I don't think I've ever had a student actually. Their horizons. I'm sorry. So it's the liberal arts broaden their horizons approach. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is collaborating with uh, people in industry. Mm, uh, yeah. We choose to collaborate with their. I know we all do a little bit of industry collaboration with people, and uh, collaboration for. Other things like uh, program building or teaching. I know for me, uh, I enjoy team teaching. Um, I've also been very lucky that people I've 
team taught with, it hasn't gone off the rails because that can go horribly wrong. Oh. And then, it's like, who's going to get blamed when it goes wrong? But uh, I remember when I was when I was a doctoral student, uh, Alan Meyer. I asked him, "Why does he collaborate with people? Is it to go and get you know skill gaps or you know some sort of data that they have access to, or do they know a theory or a statistical approach you don't know?" And he said, "No." He said, "Mainly, it's because research." As an academic, can be very isolating and uh, very insular. And this was his way to make sure he went and interacted with other people and didn't shut himself in his office and write all day. Um, so I thought that was also an interesting way to pick collaborators. It was people he thought were interesting. He was well, also senior, so it's not like he couldn't explore any area he wanted to. Right. So some of it was, I'll find interesting people, and therefore whatever they're into will be fun. You know, and then I can learn a new area and a new field. Um, but I think there's a, a lot of other ways that we can also look at uh, collaboration beyond just research. Uh, for me, looking for, see, I have not done <laughs> a lot of traditional research in a long, long time. And now I'm starting to ramp up. Um, some of it's been with Steven because he's my friend and he does interesting stuff and he's a publishing god. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to learn, he'd be a good guy to learn from. Uh, Others have been just funky people that would be fun to work with. Uh, I'm doing a project now with a guy who's like really into the whole borderplex thing that I'm into down here, where you this this cross country stuff and stuff going on on Juarez, particularly on the industry level because they can do stuff we can't do. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get some uh, collaboration go going on with the various medical schools because uh, they have different approaches. Um, one of them really wants to work with us here. I'm trying to add another one into the group that Stephen and I have talked about because Texas has some weird laws where they're not allowed to do anything over the border. But that has no problem with a school like here in New Mexico doing stuff over the border. So huh. it's odd. Uh, so laws can cause some interesting uh, industry collaborations uh, for research and for data. So. Uh, some of it, there's an entire field I wanted to go into just because I'm interested in the people that are in it. Uh, so, yeah, so for me, it's kind of a, right now, just kind of a mishmash of everything. Uh, way less systematic, I think, than either your serendipitous way, <laughs> you know, which is way more systematic than my way, or, or, or Stephen's very more structured approach. So, but I think collaboration, I have seen very few solo author papers that I actually like. It's not the norm in the sciences. It's uh, usually you have multi-author papers, just because the complexity of the problems are such that you need people with different skill sets to work together to, yeah, to produce it, publishable work. It can keep you from getting tenure if you don't have enough solo pieces, or oh, there's too many authors. Yeah. You need to divide up the, you know, how much did that person do? Did they do twenty percent? You know, therefore yeah. you get two thirds of a credit for your piece. Right. You know, some pieces can get really bizarre. Whereas, obviously, in, in the sciences, you tend to have more role differentiation. You are the stats yeah. person on the paper. You are the theoretician. Yeah. You are the lab person. You are the whatever. We're not, we're still supposed to be jack of all trades in in social sciences for the most part, mm -hmm. which is more of its challenge. You, you how do you do everything? Well, nobody does everything perfectly, so then you're always going to have a weakness, and that's why it tends to better you to have collaboration. Though some people don't play well with others anyway, so maybe that's one reason why you have to do it uh, as a sole author. Yeah, I remember I I. Uh... I was interviewing, well, back in the day, what had this been, 11 years ago, uh, for a job where I was going to end up at a medical school um, doing health administration. So it was still, I was going to teach capstone strategy classes. It was, it was essentially an MBA program, but they didn't call it that. Mm -hmm. And the way they looked at it there is you needed like 20 papers for tenure, mm -hmm. which my field normally would sound insane. But in the medical model, anyone who works on something, even tangentially, their name goes on there, everything's mm -hmm. alphabetical except for the first author who has the grant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just it was this very oddly structured thing. But so, they're also two-page papers, and they're, I mean, they're very different structure. I mean, oh, yeah. Like, so yeah. 20 in their world is right. not a lot. Right. Right. You know, it just means you need to get a sufficient group of collaborators and have a good size, good lab to be working with. Mm -hmm. sure. Don't be an ass. Right. Well, in, in my experience, too, that if your name's on the paper as a collaborator, it, it you could have done, there's a variety of things that you could have been doing, you know, and I know in, when I was a graduate student, some of the nuclear physics grad students would get their name on the paper if they sat two or more shifts on the, of beam time. 
So they were basically, you know, monitoring the beam. A couple of them explained it to me as we, we did our homework while we sat in the office watching the beam run, you know, and, and that's just the culture there. Uh, I've been involved in papers where people have been added as a co-author, myself included, for writing code, but not actually writing part of the manuscript, mm -hmm. right? Because so you contributed to the work, but maybe not necessarily the writing. And I know some of my friends in the social sciences and the humanities, when I tell them that, it's like, wow, that's bizarre, right. uh, you know, because the writing is so important to them. Right. Well, we've we done the other side. I've, we've actually been on projects where there have been, you know, notes passed around, emails, and so forth, mm -hmm. to say, here's what I'm going to justify dropping this person off of the paper. Because although they collected a bunch of this data and so forth, they didn't really add to the theory building. You know, they've gone that far because there, there's still stigmatization of having more than, you know, six authors on a paper. Because we go to et al., you know, right. after five. And right. so if you're, if you're a six-author paper from the get-go, nobody after the first one ever gets seen, and that's a big deal. I think it's a visibility or perhaps an ego perspective. I don't know. But it's just the, the norms of the... Of the uh, uh, culture and field. And then there have been people dropped off books as the third author, so the second author can have their name cited. Right. You know, yeah, it's the at all issues, yeah. It's your yeah. tenure. Uh, I know of uh, some authors at, 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 at a one particular Ivy League school I have in my head where he has many soloed pieces that he didn't even write because mm -hmm. stock students write it and they get in the footnote, but he's the professor. Mm -hmm. Right. So therefore he gets all the credit. So there's that's unfortunate stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. that's unfortunate. Right. Yeah. And now, just so we can, you know, throw a wider net of the collaboration, I like the direction you were heading in, Robert, in terms of, of team teaching and those kinds of and, and collaborations with industry. I've had some uh, experience collaborating with industry, and I found that my experience is that things are a bit more secretive. And well, the yeah, to deal with, and can you yeah. really publish? Are yeah. they going to write a first refusal on your mm -hmm. piece and tell you, nope, it's dead? I don't like the angle you took. Uh, it, it's its own can of worms. Yeah, absolutely it is. It's a different game. Yeah. And some uh, of that is, is it a collaboration or is it just an opportunity for data? You know, so I have you know colleagues who do consulting yeah. work. And so they basically write it as, this is the rate that you pay me if I get access to the data. And if, I, if you don't deliver me the access to the data, then you pay uh, rate X plus some other number. You know, so that that's just pure consulting. So you know, it removes some of the downside risk of doing work and not being able to get the data. But that's not a collaboration, I don't think. Whereas you know, in some of these things, if you're actually working with them to solve a problem, they're participating. Perhaps you're using their resources, and then they do stuff. I, I remember several years ago, a person who published a paper on um, uh, nuclear plant teams. So basically, they're looking at how do these teams work together and, you know, what's the interactions amongst them and so forth. But it was working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And basically, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission suddenly lost all of the failed teams from the data set. <sighs> you know, because I, they can't fail. And yet the problem was that was like 20% of the data. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, it was still published, but it was one of those statements of that's the risk you run on any of this stuff that they, you know, just refuse access, as Robert, you were suggesting. Sure. Right. Sure. And that bleeds into the idea, too, of collaborating with government agencies and, you know, where you get into this whole interesting thing about avoiding double funding. So, you know, the Department of Energy supports this lab, so the National Science Foundation can't provide grants to this particular agency because now the government's double pay. So it's a lot of collaborations can get interesting very quickly in ways that I didn't really appreciate as a grad student. Because, you know, as a grad student, you're not writing grants, you're just doing what your advisor tells you in terms of working on these problems. Mm -hmm. And you learn, you know, once you get out into the, into the big, big wide world that, wow, it's, it's uh, collaboration is, a, it can be a tricky thing. Yeah, because especially you write the grants one way and then IRB wants something a different way. Right. You know, which one are you going to piss off? Right. Well, that's a more complicated issue when you start doing multi-university collaborations. What is, you know, the IRB at place one says one thing, IRB at place two says something else, and IRB three says you can't do it. I mean, I'm involved in a project right now that's a cross-border collaboration, and the Mexican IRB, you know, went right through, but the two of the U.S. IRBs had different concerns about the project. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's just one of those statements of, well, where do we go? You know, what's the true answer for how you're supposed to do this? Do you even need it? If I never even touch the data, do I ever, do I need IRB? And that's just issues on some of this collaboration. Sometimes it's just kind of a pain in the butt if the most difficult IRB becomes the standard that you all have to work through. Right. Or contradictory. Yeah. 
I mean, they can give you truly contradictory things. Yeah. You must do this. You may not do this. Right. I was like, well, what the hell do we do now? Right. Sure. Got the one person from the project until data gathering is complete, which under most IRB standards means you then have a different standard to come in because the data is already gathered. Right. I mean, talk about, it's unethical as hell, but you know, what are you going to do? Yep. Well, and in addition, once you start talking about multiple multi-nation sort of collaborations, international collaborations, then you have the issue of funding. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the sciences, certain government agencies won't fund international uh, or foreign agents. And that could be another university, whatever the case may be, however that's defined. So then you're in this position of, okay, I think I can get funding for my bit and you think you can get funding for your bit. And then can we get these things to have overlapping bits so that we actually are funded to work together? Uh, it's a little dance that you have to play, um, a little it's game. More complicated for someone like you in sciences. It can be, yeah. Well, particularly since there are no, secrets in social sciences. Yeah, yeah, but th there are things that are run through um, funding agencies as to whether or not the paper has to basically be deposited after it's published, deposited in a repository or something like that. You know, in the U.S., maybe they, you're not supposed to do that, but in another place, you're required to do it. And how are you going to handle that issue? Sure. Yeah, full access thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. In addition, you know, if you have a government um, agency that's, that's that's granting you the money that's that's paid for by U.S. taxpayers, then they can make the argument that we don't want. U.S. taxpayer money paying somebody in, right. uh, let's just say Mexico. We was continuing the example you guys were talking about. You know, researchers in Mexico, the money they want to keep the money in country because it's the ta U.S. taxpayers that are providing the money. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not always just about secrets. Sometimes it's about, you know, where's the money coming from? Right. Yeah, it can be tricky. Yep. Now, um, Robert, you had mentioned earlier about uh, team teaching or collaboration through teaching. I've never had the joy of uh, team teaching. I don't know. Have you, Stephen? Yeah. Goes well. <laughs> I've only done it once, and it was with Robert. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So it was, was a awful. terrible experience. I mean, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like team teaching a lot. Uh, I, well, just think of it this way. It's the difference between the solo podcast and the duo. You know, there's someone there to fill in the gaps if you space or you get sick. You know, or you just don't want to do it that day. Um, or you just start bouncing ideas off each other. You fill in gaps. You're there to answer. Particularly as you work your way up, you start dealing with executives um, or graduate students. You may not know what the hell they're talking about, but the other guy might. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you know, to look over and you're just like, uh, yes, of course, we agree on this completely, this thing that I've never heard of. <laughs> you know, I look like an idiot. Uh, and lose credibility with your students, and then you're dead. Mm -hmm. so you yeah. Lose credibility um, because they make the mistake a lot of times of assuming you know everything. And the moment you sort of show a single flaw, you know it's all over. Uh, I've even gotten to the part on that where I've even talked with collaborators where you feign ignorance on some stuff you actually know because then the students will assume you know everything else. <laughs> Start screwing with their done <laughs> <own> stuff. <laughs> oh. I was not aware of that one. Like that's the so one thing. Guy in the is blue. This guy is interesting. Fascinating. Yes. Um, yeah, but team teaching could be. A, it can be a hell of a lot of fun, particularly if you get people. Uh, I did one where I taught it with a uh, an IE professor. So, and it was an experimental class, and it, it was me, and it was a uh, Tim Simpson, IE professor at Penn State. So we're teaching this class on tech commercialization, and we're going back and forth. We thought the class sucked, quite frankly. <laughs> you know, we thought, wow. Well, we learned a lot. We got like perfect sevens from the students. They thought it was like the greatest thing ever. And we're looking at each other like, okay. So apparently that went a lot better than we thought. Um, because between the two of us, I think we both were holding ourselves to a much higher standard than if someone else, another professor wasn't watching. Right. Um, so I can we see that all the flaws in our delivery. And so maybe that even caused us to push and actually produce a little better than we would have otherwise, even though we were more self-critical. Um, Cause students thought it was great. And we had students from many different fields in that class. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've, I've done it, but I did it in uh, as a grad student. As a grad okay. student, my team taught strategy. Um, Cause in my program, we tried to get it so all the doc students taught one of the core courses cause it helped with the market. Sure. Neither of us had taught strategy. It was right at the end. It was just like, crap, we got to get around to teach strategy. Let's do it. Let's see teaching. So that worked really well. 
um, where the institution I'm at now won't allow a, a, one, a PhD student to teach the capstone strategy. We're having some technical difficulties with Robert's audio feed. He was offended by the uh, insulting a New Mexico PhD uh, student or something along those lines. That might be, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but I think the the point is well taken, and and you know, let me let me put the other side of this conversation, which is that if you are um, doing a team class, uh, are you back there. Maybe I don't know. We might have lost him still. Uh, if you're teaching a team class, one of the things that are, or team teaching a class, you you do need to have yeah. a co a confluence really. of styles. You need a similar styles, right, mm -hmm. between two people. And so, I, I've had friends of mine who have tried to work and do a team class where, you know, one wanted to be structured and you know plan every moment, every beat in the conversation. Another one wanted to be you know off the cuff, uh, you know improv basically that kind of style well those don't necessarily mesh unless you put a lot of work into that basically one person right. puts in the, the structure and the other one can improv off of the major structure but it, you know it could be uncomfortable for both sides um so you you know that may be more work you have to be comfortable with that and i think that was it my, my one team teaching class we actually it was three of us teaching and one person wants a lot of structure one person uh in the case of robert wants nothing resembling structure and i'm somewhere in between i like to have a structure but i only vaguely reference that there is a structure yeah um, that's that's my approach as well usually i can i can imagine basically i can think of maybe no more than five people I would want to team teach with for the first time. In fact, maybe I should say no more than three. Because <laughs> it's like, it's the first time, right? And mm -hmm. so you want to know this person fairly well. At least I do. It's mm -hmm. the first, you know, and sort of know what to expect and not have to worry about that so much as is delivering the content of the course. Right. Um, it's something I'm interested in trying, and I can definitely see a different outlets. Now, as a department chair, one of the things that pops to my mind immediately when people start talking about team teaching and collaboration, especially a small um, uh, department, is how do we get all the credits sorted yeah. out to make sure that you know we're able to cover what we normally cover, or at least how do we count the credits, and we don't really have the ability to absorb half a class, right. you know? Um, so how do we how do we handle that? That's a challenge to or you know or how should it be counted at all? Maybe it shouldn't be half a class. Maybe you know there should be a whole class for each person. I don't know, uh, but that's something that does come to my mind when I think of collaborative teaching. And it's not a reason to not do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's but it's just one layer of complexity. Again, if you would have asked grad school Chris, would I ever have to worry about this? I was like, what are you talking about? Right. You know, it wasn't even my radar screen, but right. this is just one more thing you have to deal with when you're talking about collaboration. Clearly, clearly. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, the, the more bureaucratic you are, the, the more problems. I mean, the, the one team teaching class I have, which outside the normal system, it was an exec class. So it was just, who, how are they going to pay us? That was right. a negotiation that I had to go through. But it, it's not the same as, you know, you get one and a half credits, you get one and a half credits. And that's, that's half credits or something they don't want to deal with, you know, or carry mm -hmm. credits. I know our, our uh, admins are very unhappy when we have to deal with, oh, well, you know, you're three credits ahead right now, so uh, that's bad. Don't do that. Right. Um, you know, nobody wants that situation to happen. Yeah, and it's not necessarily been bureaucracy, but size, small size is a problem. Because, you know, if you do two people in one class, you could be effectively missing one class from each of those departments. Right. Right, or two classes from the same department. So how do you, how do you absorb that? How is that handled? They're not impossible obstacles to overcome. But they're just things you just have to be aware of yes. while, while going into. That's fair. So I think we have uh, uh, might have lost Robert in the uh, conversation. He keeps. If, if for those of you watching on audio, you might see Robert unfreeze and then freeze and unfreeze and freeze. Yes. <laughs> but those on audio probably aren't seeing that at all. Uh, I just heard that he's dropped out of the conversation. So uh, I think we will go ahead and wrap the show up. It's a good discussion on collaboration tonight. Uh, if you like what you've heard, please click like or subscribe, iTunes, YouTube. Um, leave some comments. Please leave us some feedback on YouTube okay. or iTunes. And also, uh, please, in addition, um, consider um, uh, tweeting us at a Professor's Life to uh, let us know what you think and to suggest some topics. 
And I think I kind of got rambly. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I was distracted because Robert's image is now changing on my Skype feed and it threw me off. Yeah. So, all right. So anyway, that's all for today, folks. And uh, just get back to writing.